Hi everybody, uh, Ankit here. I just wanted to make a short video going over Turing reductions because I noticed that there was a lot of questions in my office hours and also on Piazza and in my discussion over kind of how these Turing reductions work. And I wanted to go over kind of the intuition for how you actually develop these Turing reductions, specifically when we create the submachine, how do I figure out what to what to put in that submachine. And I think there was uh, some confusion on that. So I just wanted to go over it, uh, hopefully pretty quick, just right before the midterm. Um, so over here, we can see that we have the language L and it's equal to the set of all machines that loop on 42 and 376 and reject 281. So first of all, with any of these questions, the first thing I wanna do is I wanna kind of understand what, um, what, what, my machine actually is like what 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 kind of machines are going to be in the language and what kind of machines are not going to be in the language and so as we said any machine that's in this language l has to take in has to loop on both 42 and 376 and it has to reject 281 and if it doesn't do all of those things then it's not in l right and so we want to prove that l is undecidable right and that means that we won't be able to write a program that could take in another program and determine if it sort of meets these requirements. In other words, you can think of like these sort of things, um, these things listed right here as kind of requirements for L. And if a machine meets those requirements, then a decider for L should be able to determine that it actually does meet those requirements and then accept. And this is undecidable because remember, anytime we're sort of talking about machine behavior, it's generally gonna be undecidable, right? And so um, the way we prove it is through a Turing reduction. And generally, like the idea behind a Turing reduction is it's, it's fundamentally to prove undecidability, it's fundamentally a proof by contradiction, right? So we want to show that if we had a decider for this language L, then we would be able to decide a language that we know is undecidable, right? So we would be able to decide, uh, for example, L halt, right? And we know that we can't decide L halt. So if we can decide L halt using a decider for L, that must mean that L is undecidable. Otherwise, there, there's a contradiction, right? So we start the Turing reduction by just assuming, assume that uh, B, is a black box decider for L. And so what does that mean about B? That means B is going to decide L. So B is going to take an input of M and it's going to determine if M loops on 42 and 376 and rejects 281. And if it does all of those things, it'll accept. And if it doesn't do those things, it'll reject. Remember, we're our whole goal here is to prove that B doesn't exist. But we do that by assuming that it does exist and then showing that its existence will lead to a contradiction, right? So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to perform a reduction to show that L halt is reducible to L. So like, I just like to write that we want to show Now, obviously we haven't proven this yet, but the L halt is turn reducible to L, which means that we want to create a decider for L halt. So we're going to define A on input M and X. And so if A is going to be our decider for L halt, that means it needs to take in inputs of a machine M and an input X. And ultimately A needs to accept if M halts on X and A needs to reject if M loops on X, right? So we want to be able to use uh, sort of our decider B in this process to decide if A halts on, if A, if, if M halts on X, right? And so how do we do that? Well, the, the issue with just passing M into B is that M's behavior on 42 and 376 and 281 doesn't necessarily have anything to do with M's behavior on X, right? So we wanna create another machine where its behavior on 42, 376 and 281 will directly correspond to M's behavior on X, right? Whether M halts on X. So I'm sort of gonna just define this M prime. And then after I define it, I'll kind of show you my logic in how I can, came up with it. So I'm gonna define another machine M prime and it's gonna be on some input W, right? And so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to uh, uh, run M on X first. And if, and so like it's, once we've gotten past this point, we've ran, we've ran M on X. Uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna say if W equals 376, Three hundred and seventy-six or W equals forty-two. Then loop. If W equals two hundred and eighty-one, then reject. Right. And so now what I've done here is I've defined this machine M prime. 
right? And so let's just, let's just, before we go any further, let's just analyze what M prime is actually doing here. And so we can notice that what, we, what we've done is the first thing we do in M prime is we run M on X. So doing this creates this sort of division point in our program. And what I mean by that is let's examine what will happen if M halts on X. If M halts on X, that means this line of code that I've just put this line next to will finish, right? And that means this, these two blocks, these two lines of code will actually get executed and then they'll, they'll, they'll have some impact on M prime. But let's say M does not halt on X. That means we'll actually be stuck on that line of code, this run M on X forever. It'll loop forever. And so that means no matter what, and we don't even get a chance to look at what W is. Right, so that means regardless of what W is, if M does not halt on X, we're going to keep running it forever. And the whole point of W here is just that every time you define a machine, we have some input to the machine, right? And so for M prime, the input is W, it's just a different name than X because we're defining, we're writing the code for a machine and we're going to run M on X specifically within that machine, right? So sort of above this division point, we can, we can notice that if M loops on x that would imply that uh, m prime loops on everything right no matter what w is m prime is going to loop on it but let's say m doesn't loop on x let's say m finishes uh, if m finishes as in if m finishes its execution on x then we're going to move into this sort of second part of the program because it actually will be accessed and now we can notice that these these sort of if statements are going to actually come into play right and uh there is i guess one thing i forgot here i, I guess just else reject but um so now what what what, what we can notice is that if m halts on x then that would imply that M prime loops on 376 and 42 and rejects 281. It also rejects everything else, but the key point here is that because M prime loops on 376 and 42 and rejects 281, M prime actually fits the requirements of our language L, right? Remember L, for a language to be an L, sorry, a machine to be an L, then it must loop on 42 and 376 and reject 281, right? And so notice that if 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 it's, if we get past this run m on x, then m prime will always fit into that into that sort of into that requirement. But if we don't get past that line, if we if we always stay stuck on running m on x, then we don't meet this rejects two eighty one requirement because we're going to loop on everything, and so therefore m prime is not going to be an L, right? And so this is sort of the way I constructed m prime is such that I have this division point where I'm running m on x, and sort of if it doesn't make it past that division point, it's not going to be in the language, and if it does make it past the division point, then it will be in the language. Notice I could like you can do this the other way too. Like for example, if the only requirement was for M to loop on 42 and 376, then I would actually have to do it the other way around, such that M prime is only in the language if M doesn't halt on X. But in this case, I, I was able to do it such that it sort of corresponds directly. Um, and so now continuing, I can sort of wrap up this entire reduction by just um whoops by just uh by just sort of running m running our decider b on m prime so now i just need to run b on m prime and if b accepts then we can accept and if b rejects then we can reject and so let's let's just understand that we know what this means so the reason we're, we're going to go ahead and if run B on M prime, which means we're going to take this code that we wrote for M prime and we're going to pass it into B, right? And so B, remember, is deciding if the code for some machine is meeting, meets the requirements of L, right? And so remember that if B decides that, okay, this M prime is, is inside of L, that must mean that M prime loops on 42 and 376 and rejects 281, right? And the only way that's possible is if M prime had reached this sort of this segment of code here, right? And that's why if M prime reaches the segment of code here, that's only possible if M halts on X, right? So that's why we know if B accepts, 
that must mean we should accept. And the same thing the other way around. If B rejects, that must mean that M prime does not, does not fit the requirements of L, right? It does not loop on 42 and 376 and reject 281, it, it obvious, it, it, which means it's not rejecting 281, right? It's not rejecting 281, which means that it's never gotten past this line. So it's, it's, it's continuously running M on X, which means that we, M doesn't halt on X, which means that we should also reject, right? And so now we sort of do our analysis portion. If um, M and X are in L halt, that implies that, so, so if M and X are in L halt, that means M halts on X, which means that M prime loops on 376, 42, and rejects 281 which means that M, the M prime is inside of the language L, which means that B should accept, which means that we accept, A accepts. And we have a very similar thing here. If, um, if M and X are not in L halt, are not in L halt, it's pretty much the same thing. It's just the opposite, right? So that means that M, M loops on X, which means that M prime actually just loops on everything. And it, because it loops on everything and it doesn't reject 281, then M prime is not in L, right? Because it doesn't meet our requirements for being in L, which means that B rejects, which means that we are going to reject, right? A is going to reject. And this shows basically that that um, we have a valid Turing reduction from L halt to L, to, to L, right? And so because, uh, and so I guess I'm going to, uh, I kind of ran out of screen here, um, but I'll, I'll continue like up here because, um, so because we've shown that A decides L halt, that must mean that L halt is Turing reducible to L, which must mean that L is undecidable, right? Because L halt, the, the whole logic behind this is that because we already know L halt is undecidable, we've shown that if L were to be decidable, we would actually be able to decide L halt, which must mean that L cannot be decidable. So that's why we can just write L as undecidable. So hopefully that made sense to everybody. If you guys have any questions, you can follow up with more, but um, I just wanted to kind of go over the intuition behind why this works and kind of how I construct this M prime. So that's what I've noticed a lot of confusion on, like how specifically you can construct the M prime. And I always sort of follow the same process of, first I like think about what happens if I just run M on X and then I think about, okay, so if M finishes, it's gonna get past this point. And if M doesn't finish, it's not gonna get past that point. So like that, I can use W then to modify the behavior uh, depending on if M finishes or if M doesn't finish, right? So that's kind of the distinction there. Um, hopefully that made sense to everybody. Um, good luck on the midterm. Thanks.